I was walking along a sidewalk on my way to the library by a row of houses when I noticed a big square box tied around a tree. The box had a roof and wood shingles on its side making it look like a small house. It had a glass front door and above that was a little sign that read, Free Library. By then I was past the box, but I could see a row of books behind the glass. I stopped and went back, took a closer look, and saw a small, pinkish-purplish paperback book, Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. I read it years ago, and I remember thinking, what a maddening, difficult book. It was a bestseller. The timing, the title, Zen and the motorcycle, both very cool. So it was famous, admired, even revered. I opened the glass door and took the book. The reviews inside the front cover began with glowing and ended up with brilliant, genius, miracle, and masterpiece. When I finished reading it years ago, I wondered if I was the only one who had read the entire thing. Such a demanding book. The author was writing technical manuals at the time, and this book is a philosophical tech manual, a dissertation embodied in a narrative, the author called it. It's the story of a father and son on a motorcycle trip from Minnesota to San Francisco. The father was a professor who was challenging the teaching methods and eventually took on all of Western culture and thought, a vast undertaking. He wound up going crazy, wandering around the streets of Chicago, thinking that all of it, everything around him, was, wrong, was dead wrong, then shutting himself up in a room, telling his family to go, to leave him, not eating or sleeping, sitting in a pool of urine, letting cigarettes burn down and scorch his fingers. His wife called for help and he was taken away to a mental hospital where he was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic and given 28 separate treatments of electroshock therapy known as Annihilation ECS, Electron Convulsive Shock. He now believes his former self is dead. I never met him, he says, never will. But traces of him remain, dim memories. And the author seeks him out, calling him Phaedrus, after a character in one of Plato's dialogues. Phaedrus is wolf in Greek. As they ride the motorcycle, he reconstructs the life of this man, his former self, which is eerie and unsettling. Archaeology, he calls it, digging up his past. The physical journey overlays and resembles the metaphysical one, in which he is discovering or uncovering his past and explaining the history of Western philosophy, the higher ground of thought, metaphysical mountain climbing, into the upper reaches of analysis and abstraction. It is a lot to plow through, and it's difficult. It is brilliant, and it's also quite mad. I want to talk about the underlying form of the world of underlying form itself, he writes. He is always wanting to talk. The book is a discourse a completely one-sided conversation which he calls a series of shiitakwas, meditations. The end result is an elevation of what he calls quality, which could be God or the Tao or the good in Plato. He believes that if we could return to quality, to the sense and spirit of individual worth, to everyone restoring their supply of gumption, then we might find our way out of the chaotic, disconnected, hyped up, fuck you, super modern, ego style of life that thinks it owns this country. So he says. I'm not going to argue with that. Who would dispute that a life devoted to quality in all things, even motorcycle maintenance, would not be good? But the boy, Chris, he troubles me. For him, this is a very long, physically uncomfortable, emotionally harrowing, brooding journey to nowhere. It's the father who broods, and there's nothing wrong with brooding. If you brood long enough and properly, then the metaphor of brooding suggests that you might hatch an idea or two. But it's not quite right to brood in public while tracking yourself to an old haunt, 
Bozeman, Montana, and the author got stuck, as he would say, in brooding once before, and it cost him dearly. His son, too. Somewhere on the West Coast, the boy says he's had enough. He wants to stop. Where will you go, the father asks, and suggests several places, all rejected by the boy. There it is, the father says. You say you hate being with me, and you hate all these other places. You hate everything. People are beginning to say that your problem is you, in your mind. This completely crushes the boy, who dissolves into tears and moaning. Shortly after this, they discuss the father's breakdown, and a dream of them being separated by a glass door, unable to connect. But it isn't just a dream. It happened at the hospital. And the boy asks, were you really insane? The father says no, and the boy responds, I knew it. He is elated. That weight is gone. They take off their helmets. The boy stands up on his pegs, can see for the first time over his father's shoulders, and it's all suddenly wonderful, and the book unblushingly ends in quality and wonder. It's a judgment call whether the man was insane, but recalling the scene as he described it, I think he was, and he's saving his son with a lie. It's very unsatisfactory, to say the least, for me, definitely not quality, and I was further devastated to learn that Chris, the son, who was a lamb chained to this self-centered, self-absorbed lunatic on that trip, was stabbed to death at the age of 23 in what was called a mugging outside a San Francisco Zen Center. I returned the book to the free library, and I will not consider it again.